Hallo, guten Morgen hier auf der Internet Expo auf der Aero. Um, we uh, have a presentation here, which I think we will see how the room fills up uh, in the next minutes. But uh, as Mark has to fly back to the United States, we will start in time. If somebody's coming later, you can tell them we'll record everything. It will be in the internet. So also, if you have the need for some other update, you can uh, watch everything which he says later. And uh, but perhaps it makes sense to stay here to ask him some questions. Mark Moore, he uh, used to be the head of the Electric X plane at NASA. Correct me later when I say it wrong. And now he's the chief technician at the Uber Elevate program. So, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, hope, uh, or I'm curious to see what you present us from the future. Thank you, Willie. All right, um, I'm going to tell you a story which you may think is well into the future, but it's coming a lot faster than most people realize. So I'm Mark Moore, I'm from Uber, I was at uh, NASA for 32 years, led the X-57 flight demonstrator, uh, X-Plane if you've heard of that, led NASA's on-demand mobility work, and realized that these technologies are ready to be commercialized, so left NASA, and um, I'm very excited to be at Uber now. So, why are we doing this? Which is creating these vertical takeoff and landing electric, aircraft that can fly across cities. Um, here's one example of why, and that is many of the, the largest cities in the world are experiencing gridlock on the ground. So while we have a 40-mile trip from San Jose to San Francisco, which if you didn't have horrible congestion, um, you know, that trip could take 30 or 40 minutes on the ground. Unfortunately, during the peak three hours in the morning and the peak three hours of travel in the afternoon, those, the average speeds on these highways goes all the way down to 20 miles per hour. So these, these, the pathways, the ground pathways have become incredibly clogged. And what we need to do is stop thinking of just being like ants on ant trails and do what cities have done, and that is grow up vertically. I mean, just imagine if you had the major cities of the world, you know, Munich or, or Los Angeles or San Francisco, Dallas, and they didn't build high rises, they didn't build up. You would have incredible sprawl because they would just have to keep spreading out. But they didn't keep spreading out, they grew up. And that's exactly what we're talking about for this transportation system. Having our, the ability to grow up into a third dimension and take advantage of it to have very fast and productive um, uh, speeds. Now the exciting thing about this is, um, before I was willing to join Uber, uh, I, I did a great deal of economic analysis because as fantastic as this sounds, if we can't do it in a highly affordable fashion, then it doesn't make sense. We need to be able to create this new transportation solution that can make sense to you and me. And the exciting thing is, is that if these aircrafts, aircraft can be as productive as we think, that is being able to cruise at 150 miles per hour plus, uh, and be able to have very high utilization on the order of 1,500 to 2,000 hours per year, then the economics are competitive with what we do on the ground today with UberX. Now that's incredibly exciting. And the reason is, is because we're not stuck in the ground in gridlock. We can have very productive, fast-moving aircraft that can move people very, very efficiently. So, you may ask, why don't you just do this with helicopters? Well, we have. We've done a whole bunch of Uber chopper experiments in different countries, from Sao Paulo um, uh, to Sundance Film Festivals to different um, uh, major events. And when we do this, actually, we sell out Uber Chopper immediately. But uh, immediately, we realized this wasn't a scalable solution. And the reason is, is because helicopters are so noisy that they're bad neighbors. And there's no way that you would scale these up to hundreds and thousands of aircraft flying over a city 
because they simply make too much noise. They're also, helicopters are very complex and require a great deal of maintenance. They have many single moving, uh, single parts that if they fail, the helicopter will fail. So it really takes a new kind of vehicle that can be um, much quieter, much safer to operate, and especially be much more affordable with less, less maintenance. Um, over here on the right, this is a picture I like to show because this is San Francisco. And even though San Francisco has 30 different helipads that are available for helicopter flight, the locality doesn't permit them to be used, not even for emergency medical service, except for those two red uh, helipads that are at hospitals. And the reason is, is the community in San Francisco is so much against the noise that helicopters make. So what do we need? We're really talking about uh, three key barriers, which is being able to have at least a 15 dB reduction in the community noise from helicopters today, being able to be highly affordable so that we can afford to, to use these aircraft, and to have a safety that's at least as good as automobiles, so that's 10 times improvement from helicopters today. And if we go to scale markets, which is Uber's uh, mission, then we need to be able to have the infrastructure to be able to fly these um, all across the city and, and, and many different cities in the world. We also need to have um, pilots that are available and proficient in flying these type of aircraft. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of the type of aircraft and you'll see that they're very, very different from helicopters today. We also need improved airspace uh, solutions so at these low altitudes we can be able to have these aircraft deconflict and be able to have high capacity operations without um, having trouble of them congesting with each other in the air. And there's really uh, great different uh, technology solutions for the airspace that are being developed by NASA and EASA and private companies that give us a high degree of confidence that we won't have a problem with air, the airspace as we scale up solutions over time. So the, the enabling technologies that really make this possible today, because you can't create a new capability unless you have a new technology that fundamentally is driving you to new solutions and new opportunities. And the two technologies that are so critical for this are electric propulsion and autonomy. And electric propulsion is a key enabler for being able to get to those really low noise levels. All of a sudden, we don't have the same problem of advancing and retreating blades as helicopters have as we embrace these new kind of configurations and we can go to much <coughs> lower tip speeds and the amount of noise that's made from a propeller or a rotor is to the fifth power of that tip speed. So it's really important that we can drive down to low tip speed solutions in order to have uh, neighborhood friendly aircraft. <laughs> Um, from a safety perspective, you can see uh, this, this one concept that I'm showing is the Joby S, uh, S2. And you can see that there's many different uh, propellers, many different electric motors, and it's that level of redundancy that helps us to avoid the problems of single engine uh, aircraft or single engine helicopters. There's an inherent redu uh, uh, redundancy in the propulsion solution. And in terms of affordability, these are purely electric aircraft, and by being uh, electric, the, mo the electric motors are about three times more efficient than small turbines or piston engines, and the airframes are also about three times more efficient than helicopters. So instead of getting a lift to drag ratio of about four, which a helicopter achieves, these aircraft will be achieving lift to drag ratios of 12 to 16. So if, when you combine those two together, the propulsive efficiency and the aerodynamic efficiency, that's where you get this 10 times the difference in the amount of energy that's used compared to helicopters today. And that's what drives you to uh, low operating costs. Autonomy is being able to have this autonomy in the background even when we have pilots so that they can make the pilot workload much less and the pilot is able to be much safer in their operations. So looking at it visually, this is the kind of change that's, that's being enabled from a helicopter today, which are the red dots, to these new type of aircraft, which are the green dots. 
So you can see we're not talking about a 10 to 20 or even 50% improvement in, the, in these different capabilities. We're talking about a, a 2 to 10 times improvement uh, in what these vehicles can do. And that's why it's so enabling to achieve this new market. Here's one example of one of the vehicles being developed right now by Joby Aviation in Santa Cruz, California. Again, you can see this idea that instead of being dependent on a single engine or a single motor or in a single rotor, you have redundancy. So if one engine fails or one propeller fails, you can still complete the flight and be able to land safely. So again, in this example, we have, it's a distributed tilt rotor where each one of those propellers is able to rotate depending on uh, what type of flight uh, you're in, whether that's hover, transition, or forward flight. Now the nice thing is, is there's not just one company developing these wild new vehicles. There's, uh, in fact, over 12 companies that we're talking to right now to develop uh, aircraft for us. Um, a couple examples of these, you can see the Ehang, which has uh, received quite a bit of press. Um, that's the multi-copter in the middle on the bottom. Sea Arrow is developing what's called the lift plus cruise configuration. And then Airbus, even the major uh, airframe companies such as Airbus are involved in this new emerging market. This is a tilt wing and tilt tail, very similar to the aircraft, uh, one of the aircraft projects that I led at NASA, the GL-10, which was also a tilt wing, tilt tail uh, solution. We flew many, many flights. We were able to show that we could achieve very robust transition characteristics and uh, could operate that vehicle very safely. This is an exciting time because there's so much venture capital going into this area. So even small companies have the opportunity to compete with the big companies such as Airbus. And I can tell you, as I interface and work with these small companies, they actually have a huge advantage over Airbus because they can move much faster. They're much more agile than even NASA, Boeing, or Airbus. And it's this ability to be agile and implement these new technologies and new demonstrators that's so important because the technologies are moving so very quickly. It's hard for the big companies to be able to move fast enough. So here's one example of uh, getting into the type of operations. You can see an example of Los Angeles and uh, London. The size of the circle relates to how many people uh, tend to travel there. So at Uber, we have a, a large amount of data. We understand where people are traveling. Um, so we've looked at just the long distance uh, trips, that is trips longer than 20 miles. And we've captured those in terms of the different nucleus, the different places, the different hubs where people want to travel. And so you can see that um, essentially these are the trips that already they take today that are greater than 20 miles. And that gives us a very good idea of where we need to put these uh, vertiport infrastructures so that our aircraft can take off and land from them and meet the, the needs so that the ground distance they have to travel once they land is as short as possible. But to give you a sense of scale, the, uh, for instance, the, the average tri trip distance uh, for Los Angeles is about 40 kilometers, while the average trip distance for London is only about 20 kilometers. So it really depends on each market of how much range and speed you need. For instance, if you look at Mumbai or New Delhi, those are actually even shorter distance, distances where you only need to go about 10 kilometers and still be able to provide a huge value in time. Where to go 10 uh, kilometers um, in Mumbai, that will take one to two hours just because of the ground congestion that exists. While well, you can do that in the air in less than five minutes. So over time, you know, if you uh, think of the evolution of this market, we'll start with a few nodes, a few heliports or vertiports at different locations, and then over time create more distributed networks. And there's a fundamental difference between um, traveling on the ground and this new transportation solution that I'm talking about. And that is, if you're on the ground, you're pathway dependent. You have to have roads built everywhere you're going to go. And that's millions and millions of dollars.
dollars per mile to build those roads, to build those highways. While this new system that I'm talking about is pathway independent. It's a node network. So you don't need to be developing any infrastructure between anywhere that you want to fly. You only have to develop a very limited infrastructure at each node to support the operations of the vehicle. So we're essentially talking about breaking this pathway dependency for travel and going to a node-based travel system. That's very, very important when you start understanding the costs of the total transportation system. So what kind of infrastructure are, are we going to need for these kind of heliports and vertiports? It actually isn't any different than what's happening today in cities such as Los Angeles. So on the right you can see a uh, Los Angeles heliport which just uses the top deck of an elevated uh, uh, parking garage. We would be doing a similar thing. Get the operations up above the ground so that uh, in fact we can limit the noise even more and, and stay away from the ground clutter uh, and, and be able to use uh, elevated parking grounds <coughs> that already exist to limit how much infrastructure cost is required. Also, in cities such as New, New York, they, they also have heliports. So you can see that the easy place for them to implement this infrastructure is on the river, where you can have very easy approach and departure corridors, and uh, in fact, this is where they do all the air tour operations if you ever uh, go visit New York. Um, so very similar infrastructure um, today as what we'd be needing in the future. But also, uh, NASA recently did an interesting study where they were talking about additional infrastructure that we could distribute even more across cities. And their idea was to use the clover leaves of highway system, the highway systems uh, and be able to put a helipad in each one of those clover leaves where you can imagine Uber or a ride-sharing company driving up, dropping off a passenger and being able to uh, connect to his, um, to his uh, vertical air taxi um, at any uh, of the interchanges. So all sorts of ideas of ways to keep this infrastructure cost very low and very well connected to uh, uh, across the city in a very distributed fashion. So what does the timeline look for, the, for this uh, to unfold? Um, we've made the commitment that this is going to take place in less than a decade. And in fact, um, we're confident that we will be working with our partners who are developing these vehicles to fly in cities uh, with experimental aircraft in three years. So this Gives, uh, this uh, Pathfinder kind of test flight program will give us the confidence that the noise levels are low enough to be able to mask into the background noise levels and cities can accept these type of operations. So uh, with this Pathfinder we'll also be able to prove the safety and efficiency of these type of vehicles. So after that three year set of test flights with experimental aircraft, that will provide the justification for these aircraft companies to then certify the vehicles. And by the six year time frame from today, we will be actively implementing those aircraft in different early adopter cities, both internationally and in the United States. Then by the 10 year mark, we will have fully mature cities that are operating hundreds of aircraft um, in, in different cities across the world. So you can see this is a very aggressive but I think achievable timeline where in the next 10 years we will actively be implementing these new technologies to provide aerial ride search, uh, sharing service. I'm going to end there so we have enough time to do some questions um, and I invite you to, um, to ask whatever, uh, whatever I can answer. So, thank you Mark. Uh, Mike? Uh, thank you Mark. So if anybody has a question where I would doubt if nobody has a question, then uh, uh, please lift your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. No questions at all. No, I was wondering. Yeah. Hello. Um, my first question is actually in this slide, uh, or more generally on the certification uh, part. Um, do you expect a new category will be required uh, for the flight vehicles or can it be integrated somehow in the, actual, the actual yeah, regulation? Excellent question. 
So we're very fortunate, and, and that is that the FAA, EASA, uh, and Gamma have been aggressively working certification changes over the last five years. And so recently, in fact, just December of last year, the FAA implemented a brand new Part 23 that instead of being prescriptive government standards are consensus-based. The nice thing is EASA did the exact same thing in par parallel. So now we have a consensus-based standard for uh, Part 23. And if you don't know what Part 23 is, it's general aviation aircraft, less than 12,500 pounds. Now you may say, well, that's for um, fixed-wing aircraft. Actually, they've already, um, well, they haven't announced it, but they're already working with us to announce that we will be able to certify these new aircraft types, these vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing aircraft under the new Part 23 standard. So there's still work to be done there, but because the FAA and EASA have been so aggressive to move forward on these consensus standards, we have a framework in place. Now what's so important here is that this framework is, doesn't have all the standards in place that we need. For instance, electric propulsion is a brand new technology that needs to have a standard associated with it. Digital fly-by wire and autonomy are new technologies that need standards to be uh, uh, developed um, so that these aircraft can be certified. But the wonderful thing about this part, the new Part 23 framework is that it can pull in these new consensus standards as they're developed. So instead of it taking 10 years for the governments to develop a new standard for electric propulsion, we already have that ready in an ASTM subcommittee. And in fact, we we're just finishing that so it can plug into the Part 23 framework. So there's an opportunity for all these new technology standards to be quickly incorporated in the new Part 23 framework. And it's just, it's fantastic that FAA and EASA have actually gotten ahead of this so that they're ready for these new type of vehicles. So from interesting there is also to know that there has been an ASTM meeting, for example, here at the show. And there is also the uh, EASA is doing several uh, presentations here on the stage and in rooms where it's showing their roadmap to the future. And so if you're interested in this, there is one today for lunch, at lunch, and there is another one on Friday afternoon, which is very interesting. You said you have several questions, so I pass it to you as nobody else has a question for the moment. Okay, just one question here. Uh, so still, on this topic, uh, you would expect or require um, a different way to certify, for example, fly-by-wire systems as they are today, because I know they are very, time uh, cost intensive and I would assume this could be a big barrier for such a transportation concept to become certified. Do you expect there some very different, uh, some big change in the way these systems can be certified from the fly by wire perspective? Another great question, yes. So I mean right now, well, you know, commercial aircraft such as Boeing and Airbus make, those are fly-by-wire aircraft. The only helicopter or general aviation aircraft that is fly-by-wire is the Bell 525, which actually isn't quite certified yet. It's very close to being certified. Very expensive to certify fly-by-wire systems. So yes, we're already working, and a subgroup has been established to work more affordable standard. So I mean, there is a, a big difference between commercial transports, which are part 25, not part 23, and they have essentially like a 10 to the minus ninth type of reliability that's inherent in those systems that are, are developed. Um, general aviation is more of 10 to the minus seventh in terms of accident rate or, or, or reliability. Um, so there's a hundred times difference in, in, in the threshold, the standards required. So yes, we expect to be working on um, ways to implement digital fly-by-wire in a much more affordable uh, fashion that can achieve at least 10 to the minus seventh, more like 10 to the minus eighth type of uh, uh, safety, but likely not 10 to the minus ninth, which is 
just an incredible gold standard that commercial aviation has set of essentially no fatalities. It's, a, it's as close to zero as you can get. So yeah, there's quite a bit of work to do there, but um, I'm already excited because I've seen many companies jump in with strategies of how they could achieve affordable digital fly-by-wire systems. Um, and you see uh, essentially a destructive movement where you know these UAVs, these small uh, aircraft, they're all digital fly-by-wire. And you see some of those controllers, some of those technologies coming up from the bottom like disruptive technologies tend to do. Instead of coming down from the top, they actually start with less capable uh, products and then move up into more capable products. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit further on the uh, noise reduction technologies that might be developed, which you're working on now. Yeah, so let me is break it into two parts. Um, the noise is either engine noise or rotor propeller noise. Now, if you want to better understand how quiet electric motors are, you've got to go to the Siemens booths because they have a really neat display there where they compare the, the extra um, aircraft with a piston engine or and the extra uh, aircraft with their electric motor. And they show that it's 17 dB quieter just by implementing the electric motor. Really neat uh, display, please go see it. Um, but actually with uh, vertical lift aircraft and even general aviation aircraft, the majority of the noise is based on the propulsor, on the rotor or the propeller. So if you want low um, uh, propulsor noise, low th noise due to thrust, you really have to embrace low tip speed solutions. Uh, as I said, um, the amount of noise a propeller makes is based on how fast it's rotating, the tip speed. And most helicopters, or all helicopters, are at least 725, oh, I should do this in meters per second, are at least um, 200 to 250 meters per second tip speeds. Same with propellers. So relatively high tip speeds. The aircraft that we're talking about are much lower tip speeds, so half uh, on the order of 120 to 130 uh, uh, meters per second tip speeds. So if you can go down to half the tip speed, the amount of noise that you're generating is a half times a half times a half times a half times a half, because it's a fifth power of power relationship. So it's actually 32 times quieter if you can drop that tip speed in half. And the reason that we can drop our tip speeds is because we don't have a retreating blade stall problem. That is the fundamental difference between helicopters and us. Okay. Tip speed is the answer. If you want to achieve a really low noise aircraft, you have to go to low tip speed solutions. Electric motors help, but it's, it's really all about the tip speed. Is there also, just a question, is there also perhaps a lot to do in propeller design, you think? Because the propellers we have over years, they are very much uh, designed for other purposes. Yeah, so pro propellers have not been optimized for low noise. And there's, there's some things that they can do. Um, that's more of the loading noise and being able to have a, a, a really nice loading profile that's optimized for noise signal signature instead of performance. But that, that's a first order relationship, not a fifth order relationship. So you start, you know, where you can have a, a, a big bang for the buck, and then you will progressively go into the other less effective uh, portions of the noise optimization. I have a different sort of question. Uh, one of the disruptions that Uber has caused is using um, investment by individuals, so the individuals own the transport. Um, with this, there's a significant investment needed in the vehicles and also there will be infrastructure required that is in cars, is <coughs> provided by the roads. So how do you envisage the commercial aspect of this service? Excellent question. Um, very much so. So today, um, we have partner drivers that own their own vehicles with Uber. But if you look at what we're doing with autonomous cars, um, in P Pittsburgh, we're already driving autonomous Volvos with safety drivers. Um, 
hoping to implement that as soon as the technology can prove itself uh, safe. And those regulatory, regulatory barriers are quickly uh, coming down. But if you look at the model that we're implementing there, it is it is quite a bit different, um, and it's it's not a well it's not it's not a one size fits all solution. So already we've announced that we're working with Volvo, where we will buy some vehicles and and, and we'll have some ownership. But it, I, I think if you the more likely model that Uber would implement is another recent announcement that that came out several months ago with Mercedes where Mercedes will actually be providing us their, their vehicles to put on our networks. So we will not be buying those Mercedes, but implementing, um, but simply implementing them. So there's a good question, will Mercedes own those, or will they have a leaseholder that owns those? I would say it's going to be a combination of all those uh, factors. But very much what we're moving to with this model is, is not the typical kind of general aviation model but moving to a commercial model because we're going to scale. So I would expect in the long term what you'll see is that there will be leaseholding companies that will own these aircraft exactly like uh, airliners today. Commercial aircraft, Delta, United don't own those aircraft. There are leaseholder companies that own them and keep them on the books so that airliners, uh, airliners don't have that huge capital cost on their books. So it's a very exciting question to see how that financial um, evolution will take place, but very much we're moving to a commercial airliner kind of model, so you'd expect a similar arrangement in terms of the economics. I need to run to catch my flight, so I, say, I, I apologize I can't stay and talk to anyone, but um, you can, uh, my email address is markmore at uber.com. I'd love to engage in any questions by email. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. It's really great news, uh, news to the eFlight Expo here. Um, and we hope to see you again next year. So I was working about two, three years to get Mark over when he was working for Nasa before. So finally he made it. That's really great. And um, if you missed it because you came in late, all the speech and also more speech on electric and uber will be at the website eflightexpo.com of the show here we also have some brochures where we have all the electric news here which is in german english and chinese and so here are some copies and here is a qr code where you can download online online version when you're interested and so there are some more electric speeches done later thank you very much